Unit 1, Part 7. So we've said that our task is to distinguish good from bad arguments. And good arguments are valid arguments. So our main idea of goodness is validity. Our main task is to distinguish valid from invalid arguments. A valid argument being one where if the premises are true, it's necessarily the case that the conclusion is also true. But as we've seen, there are good arguments in this sense. There are valid arguments where um, the premises can be false and the conclusion can also be false, right? So those are good arguments in that they, they are valid arguments, like the one we saw with if Dan is made of cheese and so on in the previous parts. <clears throat> it's valid, but there is another sense of a good argument, right? The real arguments that you want in real life are going to be um, an, uh, an extra sense of good, there'll be sound arguments, right? So there's uh, valid arguments where if the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily, um, it's necessarily the case that the conclusion is also true. A sound argument is one where a sound argument is an argument which is valid and all the premises are also true. So I'll ask you, um, what can you tell me about the conclusion of a sound argument? Pause the video, answer. Um, the conclusion will always be true, right? Because uh, what is a sound argument? You're told that it's valid and all the premises are true. Those are the two characteristics, two conditions for being a sound argument. Um, well, if it's valid, then if all the premises are true, then the conclusion is also true. And you're told that all the premises are true. So therefore, the conclusion is also true. So in real life, you want arguments that lead you to truths, of course. Um, so what you really want is sound arguments. So that the, there's two senses of a good argument. The one we're mainly concerned with is valid, which is the weaker of the two um, states of being a good argument. Um, but there's also this extra sense of goodness that's a, a sound argument where it's valid plus all true premises. All right, so a quick introduction um, to um, end unit one. Um, unit one introduces you to logic in general, and it mentions two different kinds of logic which we'll be doing, and as I've spoken of, um, units two through nine will be doing sentential logic. Units uh, 10 through 18 will be doing predicate logic, also called quantificational logic. So let me give you a bit of an introduction to what those two are. Their difference is how they, so, so as we said, um, throughout the whole course, logical validity is going to be a matter of logical form, right? An argument that is a particular argument, what we'll be thinking of as an instance of a form of an argument, a particular argument is valid if and only if its form is valid, its form is valid if and only if it has no counterexamples, that is, substitution instances with all true premises and a false conclusion, right? So form determines validity is the catchphrase there. Um, but the two different types of logic we'll be doing, and there are many other types of logic which you can go on and study, but sentential logic and predicate logic have different ideas of the logical different ideas of logical form. Right? We, we carve up arguments and even sentences differently in these two logics. Right? And <clears throat> as you'll see in um, units 10, where we begin on um, predicate logic, and then again for those who go on to do the fourth exam, which is optional as I explained in the, the introduction to the course, um, in unit 17 we'll be doing um, a sort of fancy kind of predicate logic, two-place predicate logic. Um, and both Unit 10 and Unit 17 that introduce a new kind of logic, they, do, they motivate it by saying, look, there are various arguments that are valid, right, that we can see, or in, our intuition will tell us that they are in fact valid, right, that it is not possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false in these arguments. Um, to, Number argument two over here is going to be my example for this, for predicate logic. Um, in these chap in the opening of these chapters, ten and seventeen, they'll say, "Look, there are these arguments which we can see are clearly valid, but which, 
but the validity of which we cannot formally capture with the resources of the previous logic, right? So um, what do I mean by formally capture? So uh, quest, uh, um, argument one here, if Dan is Australian, Dan is a surfer, that's the first premise. Second premise, Dan is Australian. Conclusion, Dan is a surfer. This argument, it's first of all, is it valid or invalid? It's clearly valid. If those premises are true, then necessarily the conclusion is also true. Um, the way we carve up structure, and that's what we're doing in units two, three, two, and three, um, the way we analyze the structure of this argument will allow us to formally comprehend um, the validity of the argument, right? So um, uh, what I'll do, do now in um, presenting the, f in, in symbolizing this argument, you'll, you'll learn how to do in units two and three, okay? But it's just gonna be, um, we identify the simple sentences, so I don't expect you to understand how I'm doing this yet, but I'll say what you will then learn to do in unit two, but just to see how it goes, we'll be able to symbolize this first sentence. You identify, Dan is Australian, Dan is a surfer is the simple sentence, sentences um, within this first sentence, this first premise, and it'll be, we give, we give a, um, a capital letter to stand for each of those sentences. So let, um, let A equals Dan is Australian, Dan is Australian, S equals Dan is a surfer, right? And <coughs> that makes the, the, the symbolization of the first sentence will be um, if A, then S. And the symbolization for that is um, A hook S, right? Hooks are our symbolization for the if then statements. To the left, we have the antecedent. To the right, we have the consequent. If you learn this, your um, Clint teaches you this lingo in unit two. All right, and then um, we have the second premise is identical with the antecedent. So that is just A, as it's the symbolization of the second sentence, and the conclusion is S. <clears throat> so this is the symbolization of this particular argument. As I said in a previous part, be clear to distinguish between the capital letters, the A's and the S's, from the P's and the Q's, which are sentential variables, right? This is true or false. This is true or false, right? Because they're particular English sentences. P, Q, those are not true or false because they are in fact variables, okay? Um, now, this formal presentation, right, we get the, this is sort of the form of the sentence. Um, we would obtain the actual explicit presentation of the form in terms of, um, which is presented with the variables just by substituting a P and a Q for the A and the S. And then we have P hook Q, P, therefore Q. And that form, we will be able to prove, is a valid argument form. In fact, if you look at the inside cover of your text, your clink text, you'll have a list of valid argument forms. Um, you'll be introduced to them in Unit 7 because you'll be used, they'll be used in actually um, doing proofs, we do proofs, we do truth tables in unit five and six, so one way of proving an argument valid, and then in units seven through nine, we learn a second way of proving an argument valid, which is by supplying actual proofs. And in the inside cover of your book, you have a list of, um, a list of valid argument forms, and the first one, the very first one given is called modus ponens, which is exactly P for Q, P therefore Q. It's a valid argument form, right? There are no counterexamples to that. So anyway, the point is you can, you can formally capture um, the, the validity of this argument. This is a valid argument, so your intuition tells you. There's no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. The symbolization of that, as so, formally captures um, that validity. All right, I'll come back in the next part and I'll show you that we can't do that for this argument. For this argument, you'll see it's, um, you, you'll intuit that it's valid, right? We can't capture the formal validity of it with the resources of, resources of sentential logic, and that will motivate us um, to introduce predicate logic, which will allow us to formally capture its validity.